uh, yeah. Okay, Isn't it, uh, it's actually a bit crazy that the exit we had in Denmark yesterday, how many have heard about that, about Glucom yesterday? How many of you know about Trade Shift? Trust Pilot? But here we have a company that is the far the biggest exit we had a long time. Maybe, you know, in company value, maybe you can say Unity 3D is higher, but still it's one of the biggest exit. And we haven't heard so much about it because it's biotech and it's not consumer software. But still, I think it's amazing for the Danish ecosystem that we have now a close to unicorn in Denmark. So with these words, um, today we'll talk about one of the topics that I feel a lot for and which I think is extremely important for most startups, that is, how do we scale a technology? And by talking about distributed tech teams, we mostly talk software. Of course, we can also talk about other kinds of tech, but I guess the majority is, how do I build a software companies with people outside my home city, region, country? And how many of you have been in that situation where you have thought about using distributed tech teams? Yeah. How many have actually done it? Oh, with good results? Bad results? Oh, next, yeah. Um, the reason why I think it's so important is because it's really an area where we can do a lot of mistakes. And trust me, I've been there. Uh, and that's also why I think it's important that we discuss it tonight. I only touched it once, but apparently they want to, Rasmus have, see? So, how do we avoid this? And this is from my hometown of Olbo, right? This is the real bicycle lane they've done there. And I think at least when I try to use outsource development, it was a bit like that. I'm sure that they built what, they, what I told them, but it was not exactly what the customers want. So to guide us today, we have the first line of speakers is Sedo and Ricardo from Superb. One of them is the sales guy and one is the technical guy. Guess who? Right? You need a CTO with a beard, otherwise don't trust him. Um, no, long story short, I think it's interesting because Sedo told me this story about how he came to the situation where they are today. Because he is a non-technical founder who wants to build a software company. A classic situation, I see it again and again at Copenhagen Business School, and it's a bit like chicken on the egg. How do I get to a situation where I validated my idea so I can get investors and also these CTOs? Because these CTOs don't like to work with uh, unvalidated idea. Come back when you have proven that this is onto something. Sedo and Ricardo will talk about the different uh, parts of their journey and lessons learned. And later we have Rasmus from Comfo and now Lab08, who will talk about how he had his experience in scaling tech teams, I guess from both companies. Yeah? Um, and that gives this uh, agenda for today, where I'll do a brief, approximately 15 minute introduction to the topic from the viewpoint of an investor like myself, like Preseed. We have Superb, uh, Superb with Ricardo and Sedo coming in the first part. We have the very important beer break. We have Rasmus coming in. And then we have the Q&A session afterwards. And I have to admit that when Preseed proposed that we use an app, I said, never, it never works. But it actually works quite well. So we have up here, we have the link to the pigeonhole.at with the passcodes. And the passcode is Preseed Academy 17. So you just put in your questions there and you basically upvote the different questions and then we take those at a, at a combined Q&A session at the end with, with uh, both Ricardo, Sedo, Rasmus and myself. And then we are done around half past seven, a quarter to, to uh, eight. So I will try to give the brief introduction to this topic. Um, and just a disclaimer, a background for myself. I'm mainly a business angel. I also teach at Copenhagen Business School, but my main gig, you can say, is a business angel. So I'm the type who will go into these early stage startups. I'm the type that has to listen to, uh, I want to build a software company, but I don't know how to build software. What do we do? And guess what? This about distributing teams or distributed tech teams is uh, often uh, is, is part of that chat. 
So what do we think when we meet people that want to do it? And what are our experience in that? So that is the look you'll get if you come to 99% of all business angels and say, I want to build a software company. It could be a consumer app, it could be a B2B. And we look at you and say, can you code? No. Do you have a co-founder? No. But then you say, I know someone in Ukraine. Why do you think that we don't like that setup? Any suggestions? What, what are we afraid of? Why do we have that, at least had this, and I can say the same for pre-seed, you know, why, why, why are we afraid of that situation? Yeah? Excuse me? I couldn't, I couldn't hear anything, maybe I'm... Okay, Putin, yeah, yeah, it's Putin, okay, sorry, yeah. What else? Yeah? We definitely need to be able to keep the outsourced team accountable. Yeah, something about managing them. Do we have the skills to manage them? All that. Um, and if we should be a little bit fair, yeah? It's just we needed the proper spec. Yeah, we'll come back to that. I don't think a spec is enough, but that's my assumption. But you could think that spec is enough. Before we go into why we believe that, we could argue that we have data with us. And that is, if you take one source, that is the Startup Genome Report that analyzes the success of startups. And guess what? The, the teams that were balanced, meaning both a technical and a non-technical co-founder, were more successful, on average. It's made for US, mainly IT companies. Would that be the same in Europe? I guess so. So statistics prove at least that it's, on average, more efficient to be a technical and a non-technical um, co-founder. So the traditional view would be that it's not about specs alone. Because if I take, now we had mentioned Glucom. Glucom is a good example. I know the, one of the, the co-founder and former CEO of Glucom. And Glucom is a classic example, even though it's not a software company, but of a journey like that. That company was being clo close to being closed many times. They actually used one technology to, to build the product and then find out they couldn't do it. Uh, after five years, had to do something completely different. If we take most of the sof uh, successful software companies I know of, they've been through the same. They had changed their business model and the product so many times. So basically, it's building a successful startup takes these 17 years. It's a lot of iterations. And what we know from experience is that these iterations are slower and more expensive when you outsource. So you're totally right. The part of the solution would be to spec it out. You, of course, answer whether I, as a non-technical guy, could spec it out, but if I could. The problem is then, I get the specs, I get version 1.0, and I talk to my first potential customer. What happens? Changes. Changes. Okay, then I have to go back. You are not in the meeting because you're sitting somewhere else. So I have to write out, here's some new specs. What would that cost? So I'm not saying it can't be done, but our experience, or many of our experience, is that it's harder and slower. So there's a bigger risk that you would simply go bankrupt before you, 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 uh, you meet the product market fit. Again, this is the traditional view. Um, it's changing a little bit. And it's changing because many of us now are working with teams that find a solution. So this is one in my per uh, personal portfolio, that is uh, Pento. Pento is also part of Pre-Seed Academy's portfolio, so we're lucky co-investors. And they are scaling their company with a really distributed tech team. So they have Emil here in Denmark together with Jonas, but if I say all the developers, almost all, or maybe all of the developers are sitting in countries, you know, all over the world. Why does it work? I think now we're coming down to the core. It for sure works in that situation because Emil and Jonas has the experience and the skills in managing those. So I would say the question should be, would this work if, if he was not here? I'm not sure. At least part of the solution. But again, compared to 10 years ago, I would say it would almost 100% no-go to come to an investor with a distributing team, but now it's changing. 
And at least in my own uh, mind, what is changing is because when we talk about distributing teams, we talk about a lot of different variables. We, it's for sure something about location, right? It's something about are you sitting in the same room, but that's only part of that. It's also about what is the relation to the company, because there's a big difference between whether I'm an employee or consultant, but it's also something about the competences inside, meaning this guy in Pinto's case. So from being a classic yes-no situation, when I evaluate cases that, that are having a distributed team, I try to look into all three. So the first one is uh, in the perfect world where everything else was equal. Would I like the persons to sit in the same room? Yes. I still think whatever technology we're having, whether that is virtual reality or Slack or whatever, I would still prefer that my core team would be sitting in the same room. At least in initial phases. Of course, later on, when I have to serve customers in the US, it would be great I could have people there and that might have some benefits. But short term, I would like to have my developers close to me. So when I was out meeting this customer, I could talk immediately, maybe even brought my CTO to the meeting. The problem is not that everything is not equal. So I had to divide up this and saying, yeah, but what if the same type of person, I can get three of those in another country? Is one person close to me three times more efficient or better for me than three abroad, maybe? In many cases, it's not even about money, but it's about having access to that kind of talent. So if you're now a startup and want to have any specific type of experienced software developer, and you don't have the brand and you don't have the money to hire these people and give them more security than working in a big company, can you get them? Maybe you can, but I see many times that it takes much longer time. So I at least, and many of us, are open to, to the idea of having a distributing team because there are also some of these benefits. But for me, it really comes down to the two other things. And that is a relation. So when, what we all know, us who have, have failed a lot of time in many startups, is that it's really a lot of ups and downs in all startups. And again, not only Glucom, but whatever successful company you hear about. And if you rewind time, seven or 10 years, they have been in deep trouble. The first normally two or three years before you find product market fit, there's a lot of trouble. I'm sure that Sado can Sado and Ricardo can entertain a lot with them. I'm also sure that in your companies there have been a lot of these mistakes. So what you want, you want to have people there who are in it for the long run. And what I'm afraid of, if my product team, entire product team, where I build up all these competences about my product and what the customers need, if they are only consultants, if they don't have any upside, what will then happen when another customer comes and say, I can guarantee you a slightly higher salary and there's less risk here? Why shouldn't they switch? So I think my least favorite thing will be consultants, right? Second choice would then be employees. And now at least we have some kind of employee-employer relationship, right? So they're more committed to me. I'm not just one out of five customers. I actually am their employer. Ideally, what I want is that they are tied to the long-term uh, upside of the company. So if I meet a um, startup who says, hey, Nikolai, I have built this uh, fantastic product. My CTO is not sitting in Denmark, but he's a really good guy or girl. I'll say, fine. My next question will then be, is he a shareholder in the company? If he's not a shareholder, I would think there's something wrong. Because you're building a software company and you are trying to build value with the software and the person who is responsible for that is not part of the upside. I'll be afraid. And I, I can only see two situations. Either it's because you don't want to have him or her as an equity holder, which is bad. The next bad thing is that he's, he or she is actually not as good as you think, so you don't want to give them money for that or, or equity for that. So I'm not saying that every employee or any developer should have equity or wants, 
but I would be concerned if they are not having that. If your CTO doesn't have at least a few percent, I would say, what's wrong? But the third thing is also the competences, because there's a big difference between, well, you're able to manage those. So I don't have a technical background. I can't cope myself. I can, of course, talk to customers and try to understand the needs. And I know enough about software development too, I can describe it. But then this software developer come and said, Nebula, this is not possible. You should do it in another way instead. Or this takes two months, but you can do it that way that is as good. It only takes three weeks. I can't challenge that person. So for me, or I can show many of my students from Copenhagen Business School where I teach uh, entrepreneurship, it's really a hard thing because they don't have the skills to manage them. I would say that it's depending on your internal competences where you can get a successful tech team. But that also de depending on the state because you have to ask yourself, what are we trying to prove right now? There's a big difference between whether you're trying to prove something initial market interest so you can get the real CTO later on or real funding afterwards, or you're trying to build a team around that person. So I could see, and at least one of my friends, Tor, who is doing that with multiple startups, he's really for, again, let's build an MVP really, really fast. We know it's a city MVP, but let's do it to test the assumptions. And if I could do that, and if so, if I was one business student that didn't have the CTO in place, I basically have two options. I could spend the next six months finding the CTO, or I could take some money uh, with some outsourced team, build the MVP, get proven my assumptions, and maybe use that to recruit the CTO. I'm not saying which is the best, but I will not be against the first one if I was a real early investor. Um, but I will only do that if I knew that we could, or the next step will be to find a long-term CTO. So these are at least my personal views, and I think some of the views that are shared in the community about what are the pros and cons about um, having distributed teams. Uh, but now I think we should give the word to Sedo and Ricardo from Superb.